Uh, I'm going to repeat what Todd said. I have a few prepared questions, um, but I'm also going to monitor the chat a little bit. Everyone's question might not get asked. Um, and then the way I'm going to go about this is I'm going to specifically ask somebody, um, whether it's David, Ray, Bess, or Bill, the question. And then if one of the other presenters wants to also chime in after the original person has responded, that's great. Or if whoever I'm asking says they want to pass it off, that's good too. I'm going to start just with a quick overview again, since it's been since nine o'clock. Um, David had talked about the history of disability throughout most of time or way back that it's been documented. Um, he also specifically talked about the American with Disabilities Act, specifically Title II and Title III, which relates to government buildings as well as places of public accommodation. Um, he talked about the difference between ADA um, requirements as well as the building codes and um, and then enforcement of them and kind of the plan planning for accessibility. Then we had Ray who talked about um, the kind of on a more on a national scale buildings and how their intended use um, can be cre created to be more accessible. Um, he talked about different laws such as the 1968 Architectural Barriers Act and how you can um, use those standards moving forward when you're doing the different or trying to figure out how to go about with accessibility. He took us on quite a tour, which was very nice since we've been stuck at home. We looked at Fort Sumter, Hot Springs, Bathhouse, um, Alcatraz that was mentioned, the Jefferson Memorial. Um, and then he really challenged us to think about what it means to ha um, have a a place unimpaired for future generations, which is what the Organic Act of 1916 mentioned. And then we just um, saw Bess and Bill talk about um, more local projects and how to make them accessible. They talked about three different lenses that they use, which is ADA standards, universal design, as well as the Secretary of Interior standards. And some of the, um, again, places they talked about was the Elysian Schoolhouse, um, Anger Park, and Fort Snelling, just to name a few. And I see we've got some questions coming in, but I one that I want to bring up first, which other um, multiple people can respond to, but again, I'm going to specifically start with um, Bill. Um, and what wasn't really mentioned must, much in any of these presentations that a lot of people um, deal with is working with officials that, whether it's building code officials or even historic preservation oversight officials. And do you have any um, comments or suggestions when, um, when you're working with these officials to make sure that you are on the same page and um, if there are things that come up, how, how you address that? Um, it, it, with with the the caution that of course everything is different, but code officials or or other reviewers, it's really important to understand they are on your side. Uh, it's not an adversarial relationship. However, they have to represent their interests, and in many respects, uh, concern about setting precedents is is part of that. In that. Um, a, a sympathetic exemption isn't something that is in their toolkit because they have to 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 match match the codes. But what we have found is uh, best mentioned early on, documenting all your thinking, showing the circumstance, uh, explaining why you're making decisions is really helpful. Bringing those folks into the loop early on is is vitally important. Uh, we will typically start by just calling or emailing to say, hey, we're, we're starting this project. Um, do you have any thoughts? Are there any outstanding concerns? Um, and, and just introduce ourselves and get on their radar in that regard. Um, it, it is a process of horse trading. Uh, code officials understand more than anyone, you know, feasibility and, and funding and all those things. Um, 
they're coming at it though from a life safety standpoint. So sometimes it's it's hard to argue in in, in those terms. But uh, I would say just uh, patient dialogue is the best tool. Great, thank you. Any of the other presenters want to chime in at all? Um, I would, one of the things I would say, and I'm sorry, I was typing. So if I repeat what Bill said, I'm sorry about that. I was listening, Bill, trust me. Um, the, when you are doing anything historic, um, one of the best things you can do is historic photos, any kind of documentation, anything that you can pull out that you can grab, and there are sources everywhere, um, for these things, uh, anything you can pull out like that. And as Bill said, um, even when it comes, and we just had this question, um, even when it comes to um, uh, legacy grants, when you start talking about life safety and, um, and access, even though those things may not have existed in the building before, because they are so inherently important um, in the, in people being able to experience that historic site, um, we get a little more leniency. You don't always, I, I just got something turned down that I thought fell into that vein. It, it didn't to anybody else. So you just never can tell, but um, it never hurts to ask and um, always talk about life safety and, and, um, and access. Those are really key things. Great, thank you. This next question is for David. Um, in regard to accessibility, so if let's imagine that there is a like a museum or historical building that they're trying, they're getting into um, up, updating their accessibility to their structure. Um, the question is, what has changed in recent years when evaluating a space to make it more accessible? So, for example, what would be looked at or remarked upon now? that may not have been remarked upon about 15 or so years ago. This is this is David. Um, that's that's a really good question that I've I've never really thought about before. Um, but I would I would say I, I, I think the second presenter um, or I'm sorry, Bill, Bill and Beth, you guys talked about universal design, right, where you're looking at, mm -hmm. you know, more than just limited mobility uh for accessibility like folks with limited mobility for accessibility which is really what the ada and the building code fall upon um you, you, we're talking more uh maybe about um providing asl interpreters on a regular basis in meeting spaces um maybe having them um on site at museums to interpret for folks so rather than have to um have to schedule that they're they're there ready to go certain days of the week uh so folks who are deaf know that they can come to that space um um autism and and uh uh uh, uh, uh uh, sensitive programming is are things that have come up. Um, a lot of theaters do this now in terms of um, um, making their shows and their events uh, accessible to folks who who process information differently, um, which is mainly mainly the autistic side of things. So really broadening accessibility out of the the the, the physical accessibility or the the ramps and the elevators um um aspect of it uh there's a digital aspect of it as well when you're including screens or when you're when you have audio so whether it's audio description on videos um or or audio description of of um of exhibits uh these are all things when you when you look at disability as a whole rather than just all right ramps Let's get people in the building. All right, now let's figure out how we can how we can use universal design and other aspects of design to make sure that everybody is included and not just considered an afterthought. One thing that I like to it's kind of a cliche, but I like to I like to draw upon the um, Field of Dreams movie, which might date me, but if you build it, they will come. If you provide these uh, things to folks 
on a regular basis, once they know that it's there, people will start coming. A lot of times for, I, I get comments from business owners like, oh, those people don't come to my business anyways. And I'm like, well, that's because they can't get in the door. You know, that's why they don't come. You know, deaf folks don't show up to meetings because they've never been able to communicate with you. So if you start providing interpretation without waiting for them to ask for it, maybe people will actually start coming and participating in your, in your, in your programs and to your space. Hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. This, this, is, this is Ray, if I could add something uh, that, uh, to what David was speaking about. He talked about uh, uh, digital access and how important that is. And that is probably the, the, uh, the newest component of accessibility. But I just wanna caution people when you're using technology Technology can be a great bridge to accessibility. There's a lot of things that can be made accessible because of technology to people who are blind and to people who are deaf, probably uh, more so with the sensory disabilities. But when we're using technology, we also have to make sure that when we're purchasing it, that it is accessible. If not, it can be a barrier instead of a bridge. Great, thank you, Ray, for that, for including that. I wanna make a note in the chat. Um, we had Douglas say, as a building official, come see me first. We can walk through all the codes and start off on the same page. Just remember building officials will never compromise life safety. Um, and I'm gonna do one more of my questions and then probably do the awkward pause until somebody <laughs> asks one. But this, so this next one is for Ray. Um, do you have any tips for evaluating if your current accessibility efforts are actually working for your guests or maybe like a post accessibility study of sorts? Yes, I would say the best thing to do is include people with disabilities, not only in the process of developing the accessibility accommodations that you're making at an historic site, but also bring people with disabilities in, in the post evaluation to determine uh, whether what you did worked and if it didn't, what options do you still have available to you? But that's probably the greatest one is including people with disabilities in that process all the way through. And I would actually add to that, Ray, because I think you, um, both you and David commented on this, and these are also questions about everyone's access. And um, we did, a collaborative design group did a study for MHS on the historic properties. And this was one of our goals is to figure out how everybody was getting in the building, right? Or, or accessing information. And one of the very interesting things I think that we want to point out is um, include everybody. Uh, because um, my 90 year old mother who really can't get up the stairs anymore or whatever she can't do, she might not comment on it, but I believe you me, I will comment on the fact that there is something that's keeping my mother from getting in where I want my mother to go. And so, um, and also we also all have preferences and I think it's a good discussion to um, not only include somebody who might have a disability, but also include um, able-bodied people who I hate those terms, but for this conversation um, it, so that you get an overview of how everybody is using the site. Cause that's really what it's about. It's not about one group over another group. It's about how we're all using those sites. So. This is David to add two more things, but I wholeheartedly agree with both Beth and the previous commenter who's, I'm sorry. I just, I, the, the presenter, I, I, I just see your phone number, not your name. So. Right. <laughs> Ray, thank you. Ray, your point is spot on. Um, always include folks with disabilities. There is a, a mantra in our community, nothing about us without us. That's That's been cast aside by government for many, many years. Um, at two more things. Uh, uh, so the ADA, um, w when folks tell me, I, I hear this almost every day, folks tell me, oh yeah, you know, if they're talking to me about a project they're doing, and we're going to be ADA accessible, and and they say it like they want a pat on the back or or a cookie or a, or a prize or something, and my response then is usually, um, 
Well, you know, when I come home from work, I don't tell my friends that I didn't murder anybody today because that's the law. <laughs> I don't deserve a commendation for not, you know, um, breaking the law. You, 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 you deserve to just be in society when you don't break the law. The ADA is the bare minimum. That's where you start. Just because something's accessible doesn't mean that it's usable. Um, so you really want to look at usability. And I think Beth's comment is uh, supported that where you're bringing in not just the folks with disabilities, but other people as well. How do people use the space? Just because you're following building code doesn't mean that it's actually usable. <laughs> Great, thank you all for those comments. Um, I'm going to pause and I know, looks like we have 58 people. And so I know there's somebody who's just dying to ask a question and I, I say, be brave. You can come off of mute or type it in the chat and let's, let's see what we can get our presenters, see if we can stump them or something. Nice incentive, Julie. Julia. I, there are a couple of questions in the chat that were either partially answered or, or not addressed. Now, one, one, I mean, there's kind of a general funding um, question out there. Um, I, I think Colin had one specifically, and I know uh, Bess, you know, mentioned tax credits, and we sort of linked to the uh, um, to the grant program that MNHS mm -hmm. administers that's um, funded through the legacy tax sales tax amendment. Um, and then maybe this is even, I know you're not on the panel, Julia, but there's a question on there specifically about what MNHS will fund um, from, I think Michelle, let me see if I can find it again. So Michelle says that I heard MNHS legacy grant will fund only a rehab uh, parentheses, e.g. install an elevator in a historic building if it's within the original footprint of the building, but not uh, adjunct, true or false? And I think within there is that we have that sort of definition about new construction or not. Maybe you can even follow up on that. Yeah, I, I'm thinking that that might be what this is about. So um, the way that the the grant program is set up, if you we don't fund new construction if it's not um, like directly related to accessibility codes. So we do fund, like for example, if you're going to do a exterior elevator shaft, we will fund the the elevator shaft and the equipment, but we do not fund the shell to house it. Um, it, it gets kind of murky and that's each project is a little different. So if you have an idea or something, feel free to let me know. Um, and when you're saying rehabilitation, yeah, again, like we do things outside of a building, for example, the ramps, or if it's accessibility related or restoring historic landscapes. It, so it kind of depends on each, each project. So if um, Michelle, if you had a specific project you wanna talk through, feel free to let me know. Or, Julia, I, I could also add that some of that, I think comes from the tax credits not the grant program um so th those are are distinct and some but but there are restrictions on term in terms of outside the historic footprint okay and did you guys see the question that just popped up because they clarified um they were saying an old elevator in an existing building so that uh, in my mind, and Julia, you correct me, but um, when it's in a, in a historic elevator, um, I think then you get, then you've got another, then you've got a different thing. Do you, are you modernizing it so it's more acts? You know, I mean, there's there's other things that get involved there. And I think you're right about it being, um, it's case sensitive. It just depends on, on what's happening. I will say that MNHS has been really good um, about it, the, the reviewers we've had for CDG um, about having conversations where you say, okay, this is what we wanna do and we cannot figure out what the problem is. Why can't we get funding or what, or what can we do to get funding? Um, and those are great conversations and there's a wealth of knowledge there that is there to help people get the funds so they can restore their historic buildings. 
Yeah, and just as all our presenters were saying and the code official was mentioning, I mean, the earlier you talk to somebody about your project, the smoother mm -hmm. it's going to go, whether it's if you're looking at a grant program, whether it's myself or other design reviewers or the State Historic Preservation Office or building code officials. So I wouldn't be afraid or nervous to have ideas and then talk them through. Because if, if it's not going to work out, we'll say that or we'll give suggestions and and also options that if it's like, well, like from my perspective, if you want to do something and it doesn't align with the grant program, maybe I'll say the grant program isn't right for you. So um, again, uh, you can reach out to people. So does anybody have any questions? Okay, I got one that popped up. Um, how are narrow exterior and interior doorways approached when designing accessibility to a to and in a historic site? How about um, Bill? You want to start with that one? Um, that is a very common and very difficult problem. Um, you you physically can't you know, work around something like that. So what we would suggest is start with a, a sort of a historic inventory, a historic integrity inventory, looking at the the surrounding construction, the, the, the path, things that uh, Ray talked about in terms of what needs to be interpreted uh, physically in the space versus what needs to be interpreted or may be interpreted other means. Um, and, and sort of dial in on which are the, the openings that are most important to stay in their undisturbed form. And then which are openings that are able to be changed in, in a way that will allow the broader resource to be experienced. And that's when some of the secretary's criteria for reversibility or other things come in. Um, but, um, and again, in consultation with oversight and, and reviewers and code folks, um, you can arrive at a strategy for improving select openings in ways that uh, are appropriate uh, and allow a broader experience of the site. It might not bring everyone to everywhere, but it, it begins that path. So um, the, uh, the, 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 again, the, the asterisk on all of this is every case is different, but uh, it, it is doable. Bill, did you see the question that popped up and it actually, it goes back not. to, it goes back to um, Reed's Landing um, because Reed's Landing has this problem. Uh, an individual door at Reed's Landing is only 20 inches, but there's a 40 inch opening. And the person was asking about 20 inch doors. And so maybe you could talk about, you know, how you actually look at those. Do you look at them as one door or do you look at them as two doors? And because that's, there's a solution there too. If a pair of doors, as long as there's not an astragal in the middle, is that's one opening. Um, you know, there your question is more hardware and, mm -hmm. and access and things like that. And do they have to be closed at all? Um, or, or can they be closed after hours? Or there, there are operational ways around the issue there. Uh, but the single leaf of a double, a double door in a, in an opening is only considered half the door, basically. Doorway is a good way to distinguish. You know, if you look at something and say that's a doorway, um, that that's kind of your yardstick. Great, thank you. Um, I guess I I have a question for David. Um, sometimes uh, when we talk about um, like different terms or the language used between different professional disciplines, um, things can get challenging. Do you have any advice on what or some common mistakes you hear people saying between 
uh, like if you're talking about accessibility and preservation and construction projects versus um, just accessibility terms that should be used. And, um, and I guess how, yeah, like what advice do you have to make sure that the definitions aren't confused? Yeah, so are you uh, in, in, refer in reference to people with disabilities? Is that what we're talking about? Like terms to and not to use? Um, I'm thinking more of like specific terms, like I'm saying my building is ADA accessible. Does, mm -hmm. Is that even a term or does it, should it be, I'm following I mean, the accessibility code and yeah. like, if yeah. it is, you can call it that. I mean, I always fall back on, you know, just the word accessible. Uh, folks who require different forms of accessibility know the word accessible. Um, the Just the universal symbol of access. It's basically the, the stick figure of the white wheelchair on a blue background. I think it's like the fourth most recognizable I, uh, image on the planet. Um, if you just put that up, people know that it's accessible. You could put that up with an arrow, you know. I, I, I know a lot of this, uh, a lot of the speakers have talked about not sending folks around to the back. Um, sometimes it's the only option, but um, that image is a good one. Um, I, I mean, avoid, I know signage still has handicapped on it, avoid handicapped. Um, it's not the end of the world, but we're trying to move away from it. Um, um, but in general, that universal symbol of access is good. There are also other recognizable symbols for disability specific um, um, accessible features. Uh, I know there are ones for blind, there are ones for, um, for, for deaf folks. Uh, and you can find all those just with a general search online. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, um, but, but the word accessible, universal symbol of access, all, all easy, you know, minimal ways to let folks know um, what's going on. Great, thank you. Um, I just might have a warning, my computer might shut down, so I might disappear, um, but let's just keep going. Julie, I'll back you up if, if okay. it comes to that. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, this might be a David question as well. What is the preferred term to replace handicapped? Disabled? Y yeah, I mean, disabled means, has, has a legal meaning. Um, if you wanna take it a step further and use person first terminology, that that is ideal as well. Uh, therefore, instead of a disabled person, it would be a person with a disability. Instead of, you know, blind guy, it would be the person who was blind. Um, therefore, I, I, what that does is that, you know, puts their humanity before their disability. Um, uh, not all folks with disabilities prefer that. Some, especially in the autism community, they don't want to be called people with autism because autism to them is not a condition. It is part of who they are. They are neurodiverse. Their brains are not in need of healing or fixing. So they just call themselves autistics. Um, um, and, and it really depends on what community you're working with. But um, yes, so don't use handicapped, use people with disabilities. That's the, that's the best, shortest answer to your question. Hey, David, mm -hmm. I saw it come up the other day, alternately able. There's euphemisms, special needs, a euphemism. Um, there's, if you really kind of want to get into the weeds, Differently abled is another one too. Uh, the community in general tries to veer away from euphemism. Okay. Oh, that's um, good to know because I saw it on I saw it on something um, for the office, and it, not we hadn't produced it. It was something I was looking at for the office, and it, I so I was curious. So. You know, I, I I hope for a day when we don't have to use the word <laughs> any label, anymore. no labels. Yeah, but we're not there. So yeah. we need we need it we need a term that's agreed upon by people and disability is has legal implications. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, this question comes from the chat, and I'm going to focus this on Ray. 
Um, the question is, is it possible to team with some members of the ADA for progressive inclusive efforts, possibly for brainstorming or logistical practices and experimenting with what makes the practices effective? And I might add in there, um, do you have advice on how to reach out to those communities or who to be contacts with to, to start getting more members on your team for accessibility? Sure. There's a lot of different uh, ways to reach the disability community. Uh, independent living centers are one way. Uh, then with every national organization, such as uh, the American Council of the Blind or the National Federation of the Blind, there's state uh, or local chapters. And the same thing with the uh, National Association of the Deaf. You'll find that there are local chapters and bringing those people into your uh, conversation and doing it as early as possible is one of the best ways to do it. I think the sooner you can get people on, the better off you're going to be. Another issue is to um, make sure, if you can, to get people that have some experience uh, in doing and I pretty much advise this for almost any activity. If you're making a fishing dock and you want to make it accessible and get advice, get people who fish. Well, it's the same thing with historic sites. You want to get people that uh, spend some time or have an interest in visiting historic sites because they will be more experienced in that area and can bring in people that have uh, or will be able to bring in people that have had some experience that um, they can share with you some things that have worked in the past or some things that have not worked. Uh, one's just as important as the other. Great, thank you. All right, I'm going to pause again to see if anybody wants to jump in. Come on, I know you guys have it. I always do that. I always wait and it's in my head and I want to ask it, but I just am like, yeah, I'll just email them later. I'm sure somebody uh, else has the same question. Todd just posted, posted it. Yeah, I can ask it too, because um, it's a long <laughs> question. But I, I was trying to fit in the mood of everybody else who's typing their questions, but maybe I should lead by example here. Um, <laughs> This question for I, it's you know kind of a Ray or David question, and it is that planning thing, and also like what are the trends? What's the trend in in uh, accessibility? But um, you know, I when I go to sites, I see like you know there's usually a fairly limited number of parking stalls, or there's just one wheelchair lift and things like that. And I definitely recognize that you know as we see you know population ages, or also as as um, is becoming less. Uh, less barriers to identifying, and I think diagnosing is the wrong word, um, but diagnosing, for lack of a better term, diagnosing some disabilities, you know, like it seems like more and more people are accessing these spaces, and I, and I sort of feel like sometimes the codes are not keeping up with, uh, um, with that. Is, first of all, am, is that true? And then like, how do you sort of plan for those moments when, when you have, you know, a group tour of people that might be from a group home that have, you know, a high number of wheelchairs and might sort of overwhelm the resources that are there? Well, this is Ray. I'll take the first stab at it. And that's the fact that the, um, the accessibility standards do get revised over time. It's uh, it, it, at the federal level. It's actually a requirement that they get reviewed and uh, and get revised. And that does happen frequently. They are getting more and more complex all the time. And the complexity means that the process of revision takes a long period of time. But I think the other trend, and this is one of the reasons why I'm also a strong proponent of what Beth brought up in her presentation, and that's universal design, because universal design gets us away from minimum. When you look at what the, um, if you say um, uh, I have a, an ADA building, well, the when you're looking at ADA standards or you're looking at, um, at the, the federal standards, both of them are defined as minimum standards. Minimum means it's the worst you can do. So you don't want to have that as your target. 
But unfortunately, if you go around to building after building after building and you put a level on all the ramps that you see, most of them will be designed at the minimum rather than, well, geez, I have room to make it uh, three feet longer and it'll be a little bit more gentle. That's not the approach that most people uh, do when designing or constructing uh, accessibility features. Usually the minimum is the target because people believe that that's what the standard means. And uh, I do say that that is a trend, and I'm hoping that the more people can use universal design and apply those seven principles, that's gonna get us a little bit further away from doing the absolute minimum that we can. Also, when you design to the minimum, you have no room to make a mistake. I'll, I'll give a quick, a quick, um a full support of, of Ray's comments. Um, you know, our society is only getting older. We're only going to have more folks with disabilities. Everybody on this planet will have a disability at one point in their lives. Uh, I can guarantee you that whether you're born with it or whether it's the last second of your life, when that plane that you're riding on goes crashing into the side of a, of a mountain, um, that's a little bit of morbid humor for you Minnesotans. Um, um, you know, the 4%, I think is where we're at now of parking that's disability parking. I, I mean, I personally think it's too low. I think that we should raise that up, but that's where we're at now. I don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, but there is a little known carve out in Minnesota state law that if someone has disability parking, they can park diagonally across two spots totally legally and use those two spots as what would be an access aisle that that is just not marked off um whenever my organization whenever my agency holds events we i have we have a stack of 30 cones 30 you know yellow cones orange cones that we use we always add to the disability parking and parking lots we put a cone every other spot to note that there's no parking in that spot because that spot's now an access aisle so um, um I, I do know in code that uh, facilities that tend to handle older folks or folks with disabilities have a higher space requirement. Um, but in terms of just the general public, yeah, you can, you can make more disability parking spots. Um, um, it's, it's not, you know, if you have, if you have the space, do it. I can guarantee you people will use it. Great. Thank you. I'm seeing some questions come in the chat. Um, here is a question. What is the biggest hang up you all tend to come across when making historical locations more accessible? Do we want to start with um, Bess? Well, I, I saw that question pop up and it is a little, the, the, that's kind of a loaded question. But I think when we're talking about historic buildings, um, for me, when I start looking at those buildings, the the biggest problem is being so gentle with the historic fabric. Um, it it's really it like we said in the presentation, it's a balancing act um, to get accessibility for everybody, and at the same time not hurt that historic fabric. And you spend probably I don't know, I, Bill. You can you can say what you think, but I. I bet on a historic project when we're doing when we're dealing with access, we probably um, maybe three or four times the amount of um, pre-design work. So the work we do before we ever actually say what we're going to put on that building, it quadruples because you just have to be so sensitive to what's happening um, on the site. Unlike a regular building where we would go, oh gosh, you know what? I think I'm going to put a door in there, and so it's closer to the handicapped parking because that makes sense. But um, historic projects don't work that way. I don't, I don't, what do you think, Bill? Um, it, it's probably the same thing, but the way I describe it is, is uh, I think the thing we struggle most with is linear thinking of our own and, and others, where you see a problem, you want to solve the problem. Sometimes it's not that. Sometimes it's two other things. Sometimes it's change the goal. Um, so looking at it holistically, looking at universally you know how many people can we serve maybe we we change our interpretation and that 
negates the need for half of the physical change or some other uh, just just looking at things from all angles can sometimes really really provide better better solutions and i agree with uh with what beth just said because i think one of the biggest problems that i have seen in working with historic structures is the fallacy of it's historic and therefore we can't touch it or uh well that's original fabric so we can't do anything with it and uh when you're looking at some of the terminology it's uh, the word significant becomes really important. Are you creating a significant change to the historic fabric or the uh, visual character or historic character of that uh, landscape or that building or whatever it might be? Uh, so I think getting people more educated as to how to, def how to define some of those terms and what does it mean and how is it applied, I think is really important to the success of accessibility at historic sites and unfortunately i do have to leave the panel now i've had uh, uh, a slight emergency come up that i need to address so i just want to say thank you for uh, the opportunity to join all of you thanks ray thank you ray thank you ray bye-bye Julie, I thought that other there's another question up there that I that I think is interesting and and maybe um, in David's wheelhouse. But um, the how to express to visitors what is or is not accessible at any given time, and and I know for us we talk you know without excluding people, um, and we've seen some really good solutions in our from other offices as we we're doing research. But I I'm guessing that David probably has some really good stuff. So I, I do, and, and, and I think you all might have answers to this as well, but, but, but I think w what is kind of in reading between the lines of this question is, am I painting a target on my back by saying how I'm accessible and therefore saying how I'm not accessible as well? Like, is someone who is looking to sue me going to say, oh, look, this part's not accessible. I'm going to go find a way to sue you now. Um, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a good answer for that except for anybody can get sued anytime over anything. That is the nature of our, of our judicial system here in this country. And it doesn't just have to do with disability, it could be for anything. Um, that being said, uh, folks with disabilities do a lot of research before they go somewhere. Um, they need to know that they're gonna be able to get in the building, they're gonna be able to use a the restroom, they're gonna be able to purchase things. Um, so they, and, and they frequent places that, that are accessible. So if you can, if you can, um, um, somehow state the accessibility of your space, I can guarantee you people will find that information and then make a decision to come or not to come to whatever you have, uh, whether it's a business or, or, or a museum, but there is not a good answer for that because people are worried about opening themselves up to lawsuits by saying we're not accessible here we are accessible here well uh murphy's law with technology julia's computer did do the automatic update um and so i will ably or not so ably pitch in um thanks for that david um i can also question. take I think the Colin question is for me too. How how can we do our part to change the public paradigm around yeah. surrounding people who have a disability? That is a ridiculously hard question to answer. I can do it very simply in just saying that any time we expose ourselves to people who aren't like us, we develop more empathy for them. So hiring folks with disabilities, hanging out with folks with disabilities, um, living near folks with disabilities, um, you know, that's the number one way to, to, to better understand how, how folks live their lives. But yeah, I mean, it's a generational question, Colin, you know, it, it, it only cures over time. So we've got a question here from Cynthia in the chat and, uh, it's a, 
I'm not sure how to ask the question, except maybe just to ask it, but um, is anyone in this presentation a person with a disability? Um, I don't know if anyone feels comfortable in sharing that. And I actually, it pauses the question of like uh, somebody identifying somebody else's um, disability, if that's ever appropriate too. I, I, I wanna add that one to it because uh, for a particular reason. It's it's a good question, and it's a it, it's a hard question to ask, and it's a lot of times an even harder question to answer. I do identify as an individual with a disability. I am usually pretty open about it in my presentations. Um, I, I don't just come out the gate and say it. Uh, my disability is not apparent or invisible. You cannot see it. Um, it is a disability that is questioned by society and in and in many and in some places, entire countries. I. Call, it, it's called attention deficit disorder. I tend to leave off the disorder um, and just do attention deficit, which is a misnomer to begin with. Um, um, I also have anxiety, um, but you know, lots of folks come in and out of disability. If it's depression, whatever it may be, uh, lots of things are non-apparent, and I have the ability to pass as an able-bodied, you know, cis white dude. Um, and that's a privilege that I that I that I get to move about the, move about this world in. I have um, I have colleagues. Uh, and this was very enlightening. Who tell me people with disabilities that you can see spend their lives convincing society that they actually can do things. People with disabilities that you can't see spend their lives convincing society that they actually have a disability. <laughs> So yes, I do identify, I am protected under the ADA um, and non, non-apparent and apparent disabilities have different, uh, different, different, um, what sort of I'm looking for? Different, different stigmas attached to them. And like to, you know, to my sort of follow-up and I apologize, this is getting a little away from it, but it addresses kind of the question is like, the, I mean, I think generally you want to let people identify themselves and, and speak to their own, you know, situations and speak, you know, what it, you never want to speak for somebody, I think is, you know, the whole, you know, that even goes, you know, never, nothing about us without us. But is it ever appropriate to identify somebody else's um, situation? No, not where we are now. No, it's, it's not appropriate. It's, it's a tough question to ask. In safe spaces, I think people with disabilities will kind of be like, all right, cool, what's going on with you type of thing. But especially in employment, like an employer cannot ask. You're breaking the law if you ask your employees if they have disabilities. Um, um, but I, I mean, there's a thing for uh, coming out of the disability closet, if you want to call it that. Disability has had a negative connotation as was the first half of my presentation since the beginning of time. It's not considered a positive thing to be a person with a disability. So why, if someone doesn't have to say they have a disability, why would they say they have a disability? Again, things to think about. I don't have to tell you that I do, but I do because it's part of my job. I, I think that it's at my, my disability is, a, is, a, is an advantage. I think that it, that it was um, that, that, that both autism and attention deficit and many other neurodiverse disabilities are adaptations throughout history. Again, this is just my personal belief. This is not based on, you know, this is not what the community agrees on. So um, I, I, I view it more as an advantage in some instances and a disadvantage when I'm interacting uh, in, in, in places that don't understand that my brain actually is set up differently than 98% of the population's brains are. Thank you uh, for that, those answers, David. Um, so we're, you know, we're getting to be close to an hour here, and uh, I think the questions in the chat are kind of run out. Julia is back. Um, so I got sort of a wrap-up question, but Julia, I can also turn it back over to you. I'd say go ahead, Todd. All right, I'm going to take it and run with it. Um, and in some ways, it, it's, uh, I wish Ray was here for this too, because it's, it's kind of for everybody. But um, so I, I'm really grateful, first of all, that everybody, that all the presenters were present for everybody's presentations. Because I mean, I think that make, makes this conversation at the end here so good, but I, I, it sort of shows to me like the the great interest that in professionalism that you all sort of have on the topic too, which is great. And I'm sort of wondering, and I hope this doesn't uh, cause any um, antagonism, what did, what did you learn from your other, from the other presentations? And like, was there something that surprised you or that you might even disagree with?
I'll jump in. Um, it, it actually, it, David's discussion was very helpful to me because we do muddy code and accessibility and ADA and this issue of grandfathering versus conservation code and things like that. So there was clarity that I learned there that was helpful and will inform how I prioritize things going forward. So, you know, that that's something that really jumped out at me uh, and, and is very helpful. And I, and although I did learn stuff from David's presentation, and actually, as you can tell, because I commented on David and Ray both um, when I was presenting, because I found um, there was really interesting things they were saying that were informing what I was doing, and I wasn't quite as articulate as as either one of them were. But I will say on Ray's presentation, um, usually when we look at the Secretary of the Interior Standards and National Parks. Um, there is a tendency to think those things are a little um, more prescriptive. And he, when he starts talking about them, he starts talking about them in the way that I know Bill and I think about them, which is more of a, um, on as, as we develop the site and as we look at an individual site, then we develop how we're going to address that with a design. Um, as opposed to trying to apply something everywhere. And and he seemed far more open um, and and was indicating um, that the National Park Service and is more open to looking at these things a little more broadly. And that was actually eye-opening for me. I found that really interesting. I loved, I agree with you when you said that he was um, an interesting person to talk to and you enjoyed his conversations, Todd, because I think he would be delightful to talk to about this stuff. This is David. I, I I learned a lot actually from the two following presentations to me and mainly in that I don't get to work on projects very often. Um, I'm not a designer. I kind of answer questions as they come up. So whenever, whenever I see case studies, specific instances where accessibility has been um, thought about and, and, and um, put into practice because again, I don't work on these projects. I don't get to go out into the community very often. I'm more kind of like at that macro level where I'm saying to businesses, this is what you have to do. Um, but I learned so much and I, and, and I guarantee you, I will use information from the case studies when I talk to other people about, about things of like, oh, such and such did this over here and it worked out great. So you can do it too type of thing. Um, I, I, I will use the information from your case studies when I talk to people. <laughs> so it better be accurate. Well, it's a good sort of point there to sort of like, um, just to remind everybody that we are going to share the recordings of these. So David, you'll be able to refer people uh, to with some things, um, which will be helpful for me too. I mean, I think I'm sort of in some of David's position, like as somebody who does what we call sort of capacity development, I, I help local history organizations and like, but I'm not doing it that much. Um, and so I'm always looking for examples. And um, and so I will, um, once we get these online, we'll be able to share them uh, with people that are starting to think about these things or maybe beyond starting to think about it, but are you know actually you know kind of in the problem solving uh, situation that they're in. So I'm gonna uh, just share a slide just to wrap it up here. Um, Okay, so just to remind everyone that well, there's um, an open house uh, one, monthly, the first Thursday of every month, our grants office, with the exception of next month, uh, because it's on July 4th, um, hosts our open house uh, sessions, which is a great opportunity to talk to folks about a uh, uh, grant project you might be thinking about. Um, uh, and as we're hopefully have communicated, um, accessibility is an eligible grant project, both for national register sites, but also just on general museum spaces that aren't historic spaces. We can do accessibility. We want to we want to provide access to history with the grant program. So um, this afternoon, but uh, is an opportunity to join us for our one of our grants open houses. But that's not the only opportunity. Um, those of you that have joined, you've gotten uh, at least an RSV, uh, a confirmation email to our local history services. So you've got an email contact for us. You can contact us that way and we'll get you to the right person to talk to uh, about our grant program and how it can be helpful with that. And so with that,